Let's talk about the first major tournament that occurred since the Valorant launch. That is the Twitch Rivals Valorant launch showdown. There were multiple regions across the world competing multiple teams in tournaments. Let's start with North America. Team Brax, a.k.a. T1. T1. It was the T1. first time we saw all of T1 competing since the signing of Skadoodle, uh, and they performed very, very well. They were really one of the only full teams intact team of five because of the because of the format itself it was because th th there was a team captain format so we saw a lot of mixing and matching but we did see a healthy amount of pros competing across regions but t1 really took this one got to give it to tsm though and team myth i mean myth definitely held his own in many parts of this tournament tyler he looked like you have to give him credit he did look good for a lot of what we saw yeah, uh, Myth was actually really good, but I think people came into this tournament, especially me, I ranked TSM, I believe, 6th or 5th, basically saying in the point that if Myth plays well, this team can make finals go far, because the rest of the teammates, you know, the t TSM Valorant teammates are amazing. They're, they're some of the best in North America, some of the best in the world yeah. currently, and but Myth really showed up, I mean... It was kind of a meme a bit, like where it's like, oh, he just picks Omen, he plays with a lot of pros, so that's why he's high elo, you know, he's a Fortnite player, LOL, like, Fortnite players can't aim, but he showed up, like, some of his games, you know, his stats weren't the best, but he was still contributing, like, his smokes, his calls, he really worked well for the team, and he didn't feel out of place a bunch, like, he did kind of fall apart a bit in the final, but you're playing against a full T1 roster with five really, really good players, possibly the best team in the world currently, so I don't blame it at all for kind of tripping up in the finals, I mean, some of his teammates did as well, who are pro-Valent players, so yeah, Myth, great showing. I, I really do like he's grinding the game. He's taking this very seriously. I don't think he's going to go pro at the game, but I do think if he continues playing and grinding, he could be, you know, he probably he would definitely be the best streamer of Valorant who's not a pro. He has, he has a yeah. lot of potential. He, uh, I mean, T1 right now with this victory, uh, they looked very strong the entire tournament. And you got to think that they are in the top position, right? At least for now. Right? Like, yeah, they, they have to be the team it, to beat. I mean, it feels like they are, and I wrote this last this past week on my CSGO Weekly, or I guess this week, technically, I'm losing track of my days here, as we near the end of the week. But nonetheless, um, you know, I wrote about Brax and, and AZK sort of getting their second chance together um, and reuniting with Skadoodle. T1 is the one team where every single player on there is not, a, is not mince my words here. The, the right word is has been from Counter-Strike. However, that's a little too strong for some of them. Um, but a lot of the players that are transitioning, as I mentioned before, from Counter-Strike to Valorant are people who are at the tail end of their Counter-Strike careers. They've reached the pinnacle of the mountain, and there's not really many places for them to go. That is not the case with T1. AZK and Brax never got there. A AZK was on really good teams, especially at the end of Source, before Counter-Strike Global Offensive and, and towards the beginning of Counter-Strike Global Offensive, but he, you could argue, I by Power hadn't gotten there together yet. Um, and Brax was nowhere, was not close yet. Like, he was ascending really rapidly, and then he got banned, and then that was it, right? Skadoodle eventually reached that pinnacle himself with uh, winning the major at Cl with Cloud9. Uh, but every single, and then Food and Crashies are up-and-coming pros that we have, like, have heard a lot about in Counter-Strike sort of being like just another, you know, another generation of pros in, in Counter-Strike before they moved over. So every single player on the T1 team is a high-level Counter-Strike player who is, well, the reason they weren't playing Counter-Strike professionally in, in the case of AZK and Brax is because they couldn't, right? Like, it, it's because of the bands, not because they were bad at the game. So that that's my thing, right? Like, they are the most talented team in Valorant right now. Um, and I, I think that, like, that showed here, and I think that will continue to show through the early parts of the game. I'd rank T1 number one right now in North America, but I do think, and I know, Jacob, you would want to comment on this, I do think T1's biggest problem, and I think Hiko brought it up with me yesterday, is they have no in-game leader, and I listened to all the comms, yep. I watched all the games of NA Twitch Rivals, and it was essentially, it was a lot of Brax and AZK kind of going back and forth as the leadership role, making calls, and at times it didn't go so well. Sometimes they got a bit frustrated, like, because none of them are true, you know, extroverts. None of them are true, like, I'm really the team, I'm going to be the big voice, where it was a lot of sometimes second-guessing, and the mechanical skill is there. We can all concur confirm these five players have an amazing mechanical skill as a pound-for-pound -pound skill unit. T1 outranks everyone in the world right now. 
But I do wonder if they, because I do know they wanted to find that, you know, elusive shot caller, big voice in the team, but they decided to go with Skadoodle, who had the chemistry of Braxton AZK, mechanically gifted player, world champion Counter-Strike. No one's going to, you know, say that was a bad move. But I do wonder how are they going to go along going into more of these more serious tournaments without, you know, a big voice on the team. Because if there's any weakness on T1, it is that they don't have that, you know, like, certified shot caller, and they don't have that, you know, voice or chemistry yet when it comes to shot calls. I mean, I interviewed Another... Brax AZK. I was just going to say, I interviewed Brax AZK and Skadoodle this week, and Skadoodle was the most talkative person in the entire, like, in the entire channel, which is stunning. If you've heard me ever say anything about him, is covering him in Counter-Strike for so many years. Every time I've been around Tyler or Skadoodle, he is incredibly quiet. He's not a bad, like, he's a really nice dude. He's a genuine dude, but, like, he's not talkative he's is very introverted generally and that's not a knock it's just a fact and with that said like and and azk and brax were relatively quiet azk a little bit more talkative to brax and talking to me but that's just how they are and i think it is going to like if, if they're going to stick with this core of five like i think it does fall on on uh crashies or food to figure that out right like which is kind of hard when you're the young guy in in the squad of veterans so i but yeah, like, given the role that Skadoodle plays, even in Valorant, definitely in Counter-Strike and even in Valorant, like, he can't be the one that's talking the most, right? Like, he has to have a level of focus if, if he's playing op or, or playing back, right, and sort of holding. So he can't be the one that's super loud. That's not the role he plays anyway, but he is probably the most talkative person out of all five of these players. So somebody else has got to figure that out. And you have to be willing, just as someone who's covered Counter-Strike for a long time and, and looked at really good uh, in-game leaders, you have to be willing to sacrifice your performance for that, by the way. Like, there, there is an ego thing okay. to it, right? Like, if you're a good in-game leader, you're probably not a top fragger. Because your role is to manage everybody across the map, and you should be making calls and understanding things. And usually that comes at the cost of you being the highlight player. So you have to have, you know, be able to sort of pocket your ego enough to go i'm not going to be the, the top ragger on this team but i am going to do it for the be do my role for the best of the team like that that is about we've seen a lot of in-game leaders have extended careers in counter-strike yep. who were bad at aiming but very good at strategy right like and, gonna, and that's important Emily? i want to add that i don't know how seriously we should take this tournament like i think that we can say that t1's the best in na and that's fine but at the same time, to me, this was not like a hyper competitive tournament um, because they were the only complete team. Uh, so that's also something that I like really want to bring up is that like with oh, sorry, with all of these teams sorry. in here and with okay, the here we go. bracket imbalance right. that yeah, we here, talked about last go. week, go, um, I don't think it's a stretch to say T1 is the best in, in NA right now. Like that, that isn't a stretch at all. But I'm just saying that in terms of their performance, I think it says a lot that we're talking about in-game comms and not necessarily like the strength of this tournament um, and the actual play because we didn't see a lot of like complete teams and even of the incomplete teams we saw like for example i think team dizzy would have come out if they'd been on the other side of the bracket right like so i think uh i think we also have to keep that in mind when we're talking about how good teams are going into this although i don't disagree that t1 is the best team right now come on Jake. come on i mean i i sort of disagree with that i mean there was still a big prize money to it like if I'm not saying it was, like, eight serious teams, the World Championship level, but I do think... I mean, Cloud9, for example, I mean, every player kind of leaked. They're like, oh, this is the Cloud9 team. They just haven't signed yet. Mm -hmm. So you had Team 10, which was essentially Cloud9, who were possibly, most likely, almost assuredly going to be Cloud9, and they didn't have the best tournament. They, I mean, that group was stacked. I mean, you had Team... You had TSM, T Dizzy, with, you know, Sinatra and Corey. You had Tens, the C9 team, and you had Hiko, which was... Kiko and the Gen G core who went 0-3, I don't want to take too much assumptions from it. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, Hiko and Gen G are terrible because they went 0-3. But I, I do think that the T1 issues of not having a shot caller and their, their shot calling woes or lack thereof, I do want to see that, you know, continue. Because we're not going to be able to see this, right? Like, we're not going to have POVs for every tournament as we go along. <laughs> into the thing we're not gonna have povs we're not gonna be able to hear skadoodle and azk and all that talk and i do think we I mean we can all agree that these guys if t1 could stand for team introverted for an extent because a lot of these guys are pretty shy and quiet guys and that's nothing wrong with them they're good guys but you do need some sort of cohesion shot calling like when you there was parts in the series where crashes is like i'm gonna go lurk b uh chill out guys i'm cypher i got this i'm gonna go i'll take down anyone who i see and he did that 
but it was very disjointed at that time. So for T1, very mechanically gifted. I do think they're they're going to be one of the best in the world for the next year or so as the game develops. But I do want to see how they can grow from this tournament because even they them themselves said they didn't play that well during the tournament themselves. They didn't feel like they were playing their best. Emily, I'm going to ask you a I mean, question about Europe. I just oh sorry, you have something to add there. Oh no, I was going to say I don't disagree. I just think that we shouldn't be taking like too much from a tournament where only one team could make it out of each group and the brackets were like admittedly lopsided. Anyway, continue. Sorry, Arda. Well, with that said, no, no, no. With that said, I, I want to ask you about Europe in a second, but I do want to give credit because we talked a lot about uh, Team uh, Sentinels and Sinatra and where they're at, and I know that this was not a full team, like you said, uh, but Team Dizzy, like you said, Emily, they would have made it out of a group. Like, they were 2-1, and one, they were minus 3 on map differential, but they did have victories over Tenzin Friends and Team Hiko, so that's still impressive in some way, shape, or form. It's just, unfortunately, Team Myth was the only team that was able to get out of the group, and they absolutely dominated Group A. Uh, but like we said last week, a lot of these groups were groups of death.